Are you guys listening? Meredith, we're deriving the geodesic equation today. And we're going to do it in the most informal manner ever. Because we know how much you love casual day. I kind of think of myself as the Michael Scott of the math world. I don't see eye to eye with the formal academics, just as he doesn't see eye to eye with Dunder Mifflin Corporate. I got my undergrad in math at UT Austin back in 2004, and right now I'm going for my master's in accounting at UHCL, where the astronauts go to school. I've been going there for about seven years, so in my mind, that makes me a very accomplished astronaut. Right up there with Buzz Armstrong. Let's start with a simple Cartesian coordinate chart with no equations plotted on it. I put a red dot where all the grid lines intersect for reference. I'll focus on the first quadrant for these illustrations. Now, let's take some or all of the lines between points on the chart and either extend them or shrink them without moving the points themselves. Don't mind the orange, green, and purple colors of all the lines. We could have left them blue, but I thought it was easier to change the colors so you can tell which lines are which. In any case, now your graph is a mess. But if you keep shrinking and extending the lines in ways that they still join together but no longer fit inside of the plane, you have made a non-Euclidean surface. In essence, Shrinking and extending the lines between points on a normal graph can change our 2D plane, represented by the blue grid, into a 3D surface, represented by the multicolored grid. All we need now is some manner of notating the lines that represent the distance between points. We'll use the notation EX and EY for this. In flat space, once again represented by our blue grid, EX, the distance between horizontal points, and EY, the distance between vertical points, are equal to 1 everywhere. Stretching and shrinking those lines at every point to introduce a non-flat surface will automatically introduce different values for EX and EY with that value depending on their location. In the multicolored graph here, we can say that EX and EY values are not the same everywhere. We can say that EX is 1.3 at the point 2,3 and EY is 0 0.8 at the point 3,1. We can even come up with equations to represent EX and EY at every point to generate our surface. To have a smooth surface, EX and EY have to shrink to a limit that approaches zero using the techniques of calculus. Setting up graphs and equations and things is kind of like setting up a team. Whether it's a mathematical academic team or a sales team, or whatever, you want to keep their morale high. That's why I recommend having male and female strippers for the math conventions to boost morale. And preferably educational strippers like Benjamin Franklin for intellectual benefits as well. The real Ben Franklin might have even been a stripper, you know, between his being a scientist and a president. Okay. Now that we're a bit more familiar with graphs of how non-flat surfaces work, let's keep banging this out. Let's think about geodesics on these surfaces. In my research, I found two separate definitions of a straight line. The first one says that it's the shortest distance between two points. The second one says it's a line that does not bend to the left or to the right as you walk across it. For years, I paid attention to the first definition only, but it's really the second definition that's going to help us out here. To make sure that your line doesn't bend to the left or right as you move across it, it means that the tangent vector to the line never changes. In normal calculus, 
we would say that this means the second derivative is constant. d dx of dy dx equals zero. As we move along in the x direction, dy dx never changes. Of course, we don't have to pick the x direction. We can say that it never changes if we move in the direction of the line as well, where s represents the line's length. In this case, d ds of dy dx equals zero. We also don't have to represent the derivative as dy dx. We can choose dy ds or dx ds or anything like that to represent the change in the graph on an infinitely small level. We won't get the same answer, of course, but no matter. We're not doing calculations here. We just want a derivative and then we want to show that it'll never change as we move along the line. Here's where we encounter a bit of a twist. Because our coordinate system has been set up so that EX and EY aren't always the same, moving along our line will change the length of the tangent vector. This equation has to be modified so that the tangent vector will remain unchanged. Fortunately, the modification isn't difficult. All we have to do is multiply the dx in our equation by ex. That gives the infinitesimal length of the dx vector at every point. So, for a non-flat coordinate system to have a tangent vector that's the same at every point, d ds of dx ds times ex must equal zero. We've already done it. This is the geodesic equation for non-flat two-dimensional surfaces. We're done. But you're saying, hey, wait a minute. That's not what the equation in Wikipedia looks like. That equation is much longer and full of a lot more symbols. That's what she said. You know, I've never been in a math competition before but I have been in quite a few spelling bees. Ironically, one of the words I misspelled was mathematics. It was tough explaining that one to my parents, especially since I was in 11th grade. And it was even tougher the next year when I missed the word again. Anyway, what's the deal with the geodesic equation we derived not looking like the geodesic equation we're familiar with? Well, we just need to do a little algebra. Here's where the product rule of differential calculus comes in. dx ds times ex is a product. And we're taking the derivative of it in terms of s. You get this as your equation. But I thought I needed a Christophel symbol in the equation. Why is this equation missing a Christophel symbol? It's actually hidden inside. The Christoffel symbol gamma xxx is equal to dex dx over ex. If we take this equation for the Christoffel symbol and multiply both sides by dx ds, then we rearrange terms and such. We get the intermittent equation for dex ds as shown at the bottom of the screen here. We can then use this equation and plug in its value for dex ds into the geodesic equation we got earlier after we use the product rule. After we do that we subtract an ex term and then divide both sides by ex to get this reformed equation at the bottom. And this definitely looks more like Wikipedia's equation. In fact, this equation is exactly one of the eight forms of the geodesic equation given to us by the formula in Wikipedia. The various Greek mu, alpha, and beta symbols in the equation allow us to get the other seven forms used for 2D surfaces. Of course, the equation can be used for surfaces of larger dimension, but those aren't intuitive. It should be clear that we could have just as easily have used y instead of x in our derivation. 
Well, that's finally it. I've shown what I wanted to show, and I think I've done it in a way that's so much easier than what I've found in the graduate textbooks at the UHCL library. Unfortunately, to keep the derivation simple, I had to skip completely over the concept of invariant formulas, which I think are interesting and worthy of study but Schaum's outline of differential geometry can explain that better than I can. Still, we were able to bypass the Christoffel symbols, and not just that. Look at a short list of all the abstract jargon we were able to skip over to derive the equation here that usually get thrown at you before you can even approach the geodesic equation. What's sad in the geodesic equations case is it's actually easier to come up with the formula than it is to actually solve any problems with it. Solving second order differential equations is tough and the potential abundance of square roots doesn't make it any easier. Even drawing a picture of a geodesic isn't easy. If you try to draw one on a grid like I've been using it would probably look like this. What do I want from all of this geodesic equation presentation stuff? Even though someone might have already come up with this derivation before, I haven't seen it in all of the textbooks I checked out at UHCL. So I guess what I want would be to see more grad school textbooks print this as a derivation of the equation and to call the derivation the Michael Scott method, even if it's already named something else right now. Or better yet, I think I'd like to be nominated for a Dundee Award. Watching Michael Scott do things the way he does really taught me that both the math world and the business world are all about people. Sometimes I go into the men's restroom and see that people actually write math equations in there. Only since they love people so much, they use pictures of people and parts of people instead of numbers and their notations to represent different things. I'm glad that math has become so much more human than it used to be.